Oregon's population grew by 1% this year. Did you see that? Yeah? I can't tell if it's a lot or a little, but in an unrelated story, California is reeling over the disappearance of some 43,000 steampunk taxidermists. <laughs> Where'd they go? <laughs> Crater Lake National Park is proposing raising their rates. You guys, this week they're going to raise their rates by a possible 150%. Yeah, park, park goers are in an uproar, uh, stating, quote, if I wanted to pay $25 to see a big wet hole, I'd take the bull bus to Seattle. Oh! My favorite thing is just how realistic the money is. I think that's... I can tell why you were all clamoring over your seats to get to this fake money. There's a one on this side, and a five on this side. Like good money. Hey man, I need to make it look fake. I'm not going back to prison. <laughs> I can't handle prison again. Did you just print these at your office? Okay, I'm curious. We're going to talk about this during the part after the monologue where I get to talk to you. Uh, Two men were injured, we're almost done. Two men were injured in a hash oil explosion in a gas station bathroom in Tiger this week. Really showed that guy who shot the urinal who's boss, right? This is how you screw up a bathroom. Hash oil is also kind of like the gateway drug explosion. Like, next thing you know, this guy's gonna blow up a house by cooking meth or blow up a hot air balloon making heroin. Full disclosure, do not know how heroin's made, so. Just assume it would be in a hot air balloon. And lastly, this week, a Cannon Beach police dog named Cash was fired for poor performance. Aww. Yeah, apparently he just, he wouldn't find the drugs and he just kept barking the whole time. Meanwhile, his partner, Tango, was super cool, so. <laughs> when reached for comment, the dog was quoted as saying, Drugs? That's the reason they gave you? Come on, man, the truth is I wouldn't shoot the stats. I want to do some real police work, something that matters. But no, everyone stays friends. Everyone needs to keep their job. Everyone has a career. Well, I won't do it. That was a dog talking. <laughs> Let's do one more. Authorities say the 30 crows were found dead downtown were because of they ate poisoned corn. That's what they think happened. Are you, are you guys are sad about that? I mean, they already died when we found out about the corn part. Uh, the corn part's the weird part, though. Uh, but a fun fact, when you do find a group of dead crows, it's called a suicide. So. <laughs> Alright, that's good enough. One we'll the again. Thank you guys for the monologue! Uh, A lot of jokes about relationships with animals in the monologue. I, I just, do you guys do this too? You just clip every animal story out of every newspaper you see? That's all I want to talk about, is all the animal stories. Do you guys get newspapers? You're in an art museum. Um, <laughs> You seem like you still know what I am. Did you actually just photocopy the work? No, I'm super curious. Okay, so all you need to do is Google fake money print at home. <laughs> and you're gonna get some Google images. Uh -huh. And then you're gonna print one, or you print two, and then put them back in the copy machine as two sided. Like duplex. Mm hmm. And then I slice them up. I put one of my pants during that dance and it is uncomfortable, but it feels awkward to fish it out right now. So. You want to get it out? No. You guys don't look while Alex gets this money out of There's it. an intermission. I'll get it out later. Uh, See what he does for his art, ladies and gentlemen? It's incredible. <laughs> he might get like a paper cut on his torso. <laughs> we're just, normally she would never refer to what I do as art, but because you guys are here, isn't it weird that we're in an art museum, Bree? It is so, I was thinking about that, you know, like, just all of the millions of dollars that's above us right now, you know? Uh, when we were, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of things above us. It's just weird to say it that way, because it sounds like you're suggesting people go steal, which we're not doing. <laughs> well, here's why you can't. Because th there's a team of people watching the art museum on cameras all the time. Yeah. They told us. Like, like or, 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 that's just what they tell you so you don't run them up. And everyone gets one painting for coming here today. Oh my god! Everyone takes on one work of art. You, you get a painting, and you get a masterpiece, and you get a masterpiece. <laughs> it does feel kind of like
like, because we're, I mean, for those of you who haven't seen the show before, we're normally in a bar, but we're hooligans. This is a very classy, we have trees on yep. stage. Nature. I found those in the closet. You brought those trees up? Yeah, they were in the closet. This guy was a hardest working guy yeah. in fake talk shows, ladies am, and gentlemen. I am also the intern. Um, <laughs> We have, uh, we have a great show coming up. I'm really excited that you are all here. We also have some really great sponsors we need to thank for being here today. Uh, X-Ray FM and the Portland Mercury both have been very helpful getting us here. The X-Ray FM has a table outside during intermission. Don't get too excited, but later, uh, make sure you say hi to the X-Ray people and talk to them about what they're doing to make radio cool again. Um, so cool. Also, we have a new sponsor on board, which I'm really excited about. Oregon's Health Co-op is sponsoring for the first time this month. It's going to be very great. Uh, Oregon's Health Co-op is an affordable nonprofit health insurance plan that is democratizing health insurance with zero deductible and no co-insurance on their simple plans. And naturopaths as your primary care physicians. What? Yeah. Enroll today. Oregon's Health Co-op. O h c o o p dot org. And thank them for this sponsor. Thank everybody who sponsored us. We also have these fine sponsors of booze and tea and coffee, so if you want to have to pee later. So excited. We have such a cool set of guests today. We have uh, people who are doing very cool, legitimate art in the world, and uh, and uh, let's talk to one of them. Let's bring one out now. Yeah! Doesn't that sound good? Uh, oh, I did say hi to DJ. Hi, DJ Bobby. Bye! This is Bobby D. He's on X-Ray FM. Uh, yeah. Hi, All of the life DJ. And we used all of the mics, and so Bobby does not have a mic, so he can only wave. Or play dubstep. That's, there's two options. Oh, no, no, no dubstep. Wait, he's trying to say something. What's what? what you trying? You is there what? a DJ down the well? <laughs> is it the synthesizer? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so our first guest today, you guys, she's a photographer. She's had solo shows in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Atlanta, Seattle, Istanbul, and Turkey, and also here in Portland, Oregon. Please welcome to Late Night Action photographer Holly Andre! Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, get, stay right up close to it. Good, yeah, just like that. Uh, isn't this weird, what we're doing right here? Um, yeah, it's a little bit weird. <laughs> for those of you, for the people here who haven't seen your work before, I, like, we have this beautiful screen, and I wish we'd set it up so we could show some of your photos. That would be the best way, but since I didn't, uh, could you paint us a word picture of the kind of what you do very specific style of photography. Yeah. Could you take us a word photo? Yeah, that makes yeah, can I say paint? Okay, everybody close your eyes. Yeah. Um, well, the way that I often talk about my work is I use a distinction coined by um, contemporary photographer Jeff Wall. So rather than a hunter and a farmer, so if a hunter is a more of a conventional type of photographer who is um, always has a camera on them and is kind of um, waiting and, or seeking out those decisive moments, I cultivate them. You have domesticated moments? I think so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so they're very cinematic. My work is very much in um, dialogue with cinema um, in the way that they're very theatrically lit, um, very consciously art directed their narrative. And so there's usually a protagonist or um, some sort of um, conflict or. Um, you uh, often tell a story over multiple images where you. Right, so they might be um, almost like a graphic novel where I might tell a story through maybe a series of four images or you know, a dozen images, or maybe it's, my series might be an elliptical narrative where the um, images kind of bounce back and forth, but aren't to be ordered in a linear way per se. Have you um, always done that that way, or did you start with hunting images and then you moved into the cultivation? Well, actually my um, undergrad and my background is in painting and drawing. Right. And so, I think that that probably yeah. informs my aesthetic and my process more than um, a traditional photographic background does. I've never really perceived the camera as an agent of truth. And 
There's like seven cameras here right now, so I'm a little worried about the agents of not truth. I mean, they're taking it personally. You're still doing great work. <laughs> He's leaving. He's storming out of here. Roll lens of the stage. <laughs> but usually the stories in my photographs are based on uh, I have a real vivid memory, and um, like a lot of creative people, when someone is telling them a story, a film strip of sorts tends to run in my mind, and so that's always um, that's my that's where I glean my inspiration from is um, experience okay. or incidents or a lot of your series of photos, a lot of your scenes that you set up are about childhood. Are you, you're having to work with child models, yeah. presumably, which is one of the no-nos of Hollywood, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's challenging. Every single photograph presents itself with a new challenge, and um, um, some children are easier to work with than others, and, you know, I've got a few tricks up my sleeve. Like the like the duck behind your head, and the sweet, <laughs> squeaky toy. Perhaps, yeah. yeah. But um, I've, I've seen that one before. I don't buy it anymore. I mean, honestly, I'm not really asking that much of them in regards to acting. You know, they're not reciting lines. They don't, sure. don't hit their mark or whatever. And um, simply photographing, we're so used to seeing images of children who are performing for the camera, smiling, looking at the lens. And so um, by just the simple act of photographing a child in an off moment kind of embeds it with this contemplative or conceptual layer that people tend to read in my work and it is um you know what i'm hoping to to achieve so you're also so you've been doing you did um, a series of exhibits and you got a lot of attention and you've done you've gotten you've been in high demand for other uh for, for more Corporate, I don't mean that in a bad way, but for more like that kind of professional shoots for, uh, for you, your first your first big one was the New York Times Magazine. Uh, yeah. How is that from, from going from doing these things that are perfectly what you want to going to the corporate world and doing shoots for them? For about eight years, I was juggling um, making fine art and then um, teaching, and um, I just. Decided that I wanted to see if maybe I could get paid to make photographs. People had said that maybe my work might have some sort of commercial application. <laughs> <laughs> that seemed a little bit like a fantasy to me that, oh, that I could actually make a living exclusively making photographs. But, um, and I literally just hit the pavement and kind of pedaled my ass and went to, made appointments with, um, you know, Time and the Wall Street Journal and different ad agencies. And it was pretty surreal. I mean, I was like in my, you know, pink wool vintage dress, I'm walking into these really phallic, terrifying buildings <laughs> and <laughs> showing them my fire. Well, if someone had been there to photograph that, that sounds like... <laughs> Like a cinematic experience. No, yeah. so I can do it over again. I mean, I'm sure that, and my book, um, like the gold book, because when I was looking, you know, it's um, the standard is a black book. But I thought to myself, there's a big boardroom table and it's filled with black leather bound books, and there's one gold one. Do you gold. see pictures <laughs> everywhere? Like, do you see? Like, are you thinking like? I go on this talk show and wear a pink pantsuit and like, or like, you know, you're just like living this like cinematic visual yeah. experience. I mean, I don't really know what it's like to be in anyone else's head, but. We don't the, do that. Yeah, we don't do that. <laughs> it sounds fun. I mean, now that you mention it, like the mic stand is a little phallic, but like normally I don't yeah. do that stuff. <laughs> I just, I just but go you're in it. You're yeah. like in yeah. the thing. That's cool to me. That's really interesting. Are you getting back to fine art now? You have. Yes. So um, part of living that dream is for the last two and a half years, I've taken every single assignment that's ever been presented to me, and so I've been working really, really, really hard because mm -hmm. I want to maintain that momentum and um, build rapports with my photo editors and art directors that I've been working with. Um, and I've been having a hard time 
carving out the time and energy to make my own work. And right. I've been kind of waiting for the perfect time for that to happen. And, and your work isn't the kind of work that you just like, well, on the way to work today, I'm gonna go look around and take a few photos because yeah. it's so staged. That That's you right. You don't have an idea. Exactly. Right. So a few months ago, I went to an estate sale, and I love estate sales. I get some sort of kind of guilty pleasure from pilfering through people's houses. And um, oh. this one was unlike any I had ever been to. I mean, the smell was staggering. <laughs> but um, that left a lasting impression. But it was like this immaculately art-directed set. And I was immediately enchanted by it and um, thought, wow, I really want to photograph here. So um, with the help of my sister, who's a real estate agent, we did some sleuthing and um, learned who had bought the house. And it turns out that the woman who had passed away there was 100 years old. And she was this, the second owner there. So it didn't have multiple, um, you know, remodels every right, decade right. or two. So it was um, really lovely, like really beautiful floral wallpaper and this marvelous banister. And um, so anyway, um, I I approached the woman, I sent her an email and said, I'd really like to rent this house for five days. I want to create a new body of work here. And so um, what had happened was there's a commercial space right next door and the woman who owns the commercial space had had been waiting for that house to become available because she wants to um, make a parking lot out of it. Oh, so what really? Yeah. So she was like a movie villain? Just <laughs> I, I, I mean well it it actually has kind of a magical ending. So she um, was out of town. She heard it was on the market, I guess. And you filled the house with balloons. No, I didn't. And you <laughs> haunted the house until the people who wanted to buy it left. They had to leave because of all the, the traps. Ghosts. Ghosts? Ghost traps. Sorry, so you so magic endings. So those are our guesses. What's the actual magic Okay, ending? so what happened was she entered the house and fell in love with it as well. Oh. So now you can take your photos in a house while it's moving. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. um, so yeah, I rented it for five days, and for the first two days we cleaned it and propped it out, and then um, um, my crew and I made like 15 new photographs that are going to premiere in 2015, and I'm really excited about it. Yeah, that sounds really great. We have to, we have to really quick before we go, I just want to say, I, your Instagram is really wonderful, oh. and I was just really like, just really quick. Uh, how do you take so much time and you and, and effort to put into photos and perfecting them? How is it to then also take some photos to put next to like cheeseburgers and really washed out selfies? I'm uh, Instagram is a game changer. I just I'm. I love it, and I feel like this, there's this urgency, like it's not gonna last forever. It's so wonderful, but um, it's been. Somebody might take it away and put a parking lot there. I know, right? So. Um, Download so the parking lot. I don't have to see. I I got a few. I got a few. Are you just shaking your head at me? That's the best part. Of <laughs> I have um, kind of my own manifesto about what I will and will not tolerate as far as what's on my Instagram feed and food not interested. Ah. Yeah, or gratuitous selfies. I'm not interested yeah. in that either. Well, so um, I really only fo follow other artists who um, who inspire my own vision. It, it, it makes perfect sense for you to shape that to be exactly the vision that you want it to be from other people as well. Uh, it, the food photos are great though, so nice. Like, no? Great, no? Here we go. Okay. Uh, hey, well, you, so you're uh, at Holly Andres, also at hollyandres.com. You can find out about your 2015 show when it comes out with those new ones. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Holly Andres!
Uh, we're going to do a, a hard gear shift. We're going straight into some stand-up comedy. Please welcome from Seattle, Washington, the very funny Scott Lossie! <laughs> All right, RBZ, standing in front of two people, there's nothing weird about this at all. I always like performing comedy with two people in my peripheral vision, freaking me out. It's nice, fake money. I'm Scott, I'm from Seattle, a big wet hole up north. Yeah. I did it. The joke worked twice. It's crazy. Yeah, I won the 2013 Northwest Comedy Competition, which sounds impressive when you say it out loud, but when you tell people it was in Walla Walla, Washington, it's not as cool. <laughs> like, if you don't know what that is, it'd be like if I said I was the winner of the Pendleton Comedy Competition. <laughs> it wasn't rodeo affiliated. Uh, I like Portland. I come down here to get my tattoos, because obviously, I'm not sure. I have a hand tattoo I got here. I guess I got a hand tattoo because if being a comic has taught me anything, it's that I'm really good at making decisions. <laughs> that have a negative impact on future earning potential. <laughs> like, I have a job. I had it before I got the hand tattoo, so I got grandfathered in, but they were pissed when I came back home. <laughs> Like, I came home with this hand tattoo, I went into the office that Monday, my boss asked to talk to me, she's like, Scott, we need to talk, I'm gonna have to have you cover that hand tattoo up with a bandage. I was like, Karen, I don't have a bandage, but I do have a hand puppet. <laughs> His name is Gary, he's an alcoholic. He doesn't take shit from anybody. <laughs> Gary's got the same bird tattoo on top of his head that I have on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> uh, Gary and I got fired after that. Which is uh, I'm taking it okay. He's kind of hit hard. He's <laughs> out. You know, I, uh, I hate my job. I love my hand taxi. I hate my job. It's the curse of the modern white male in his 30s. But, but, you know you hate your job when you find yourself calling in sick to work on your way to work. <laughs> Like, there's been times when I get up, get dressed, and drive in, and I'm like two blocks away, and I call, I'm like, hey, Karen, I'm not going to make it in today. She's like, oh, no, Scott, what's wrong? The closer I get, the worse I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Happens every day. I know this is the fourth day in a row. It's, it's hard. I hate it. Some people ask you that hypothetical question, they're like, man, if you won the lotto, would you quit your job? Fuck yeah, I'm gonna quit my job if I want pull tabs. <laughs> Scratch tickets, a free Mountain Dew, it just wouldn't take much <laughs> at this time. <laughs> As at work the other day, somebody brought a baby into the office, which is the worst possible outcome for productivity, because 40 like grandmas I never saw before stream through a doorway to see the baby, and shake the baby and yell at it and steal the youth from the baby, whatever grandmas do with this. <laughs> I told that, that joke to an audience of older folks the other day. They didn't find the grandma stealing you from baby's line very funny. <laughs> I think it's because it's true. <laughs> and I'm like, Damn it, you figured it out. <laughs> no, but this baby came in, like when I see a baby, I talk to the baby in a baby voice, because that's what you do. You get a baby in your hands, and all of a sudden, you're just not you anymore. You're a babbling person who's saying cuckoo choo and stuff. And it's, it's weird. But I realized afterwards it would be a lot creepier if I talked to a baby in my normal voice. <laughs> like if you handed me a baby to hold and I'm just like, what's up, baby? <laughs> you got fat fucking thighs. <laughs> I want to bite your toes off. <laughs> Man, you're so cute, I want to take you home. Is it okay with your mom if I take you home? <laughs> like, no, Scott, it's not. <laughs> I turned 34 recently, I'm older than Jesus, I win. <laughs> That's what it means. I had to go to the doctor for a checkup and he said I need to lose some weight, but I'm not the most athletic person. Like if it wasn't for deodorant, I wouldn't even know what sports smells like. <laughs> it's kind of spicy. Now they're trying out 
fad diets. Like a lot of my friends are on fad diets. They've been trying paleo, and I want to try paleo, but I'm too cheap to buy the book, so I've just been guessing what it is. <laughs> I'm like, paleo is short for paleontology. All right. So the other day, I ate an entire DiGiorno pizza while watching Jurassic Park. <laughs> It's a sweet diet. I've gained 15 pounds. <laughs> Super weird. I love science. They brought back that show Cosmos. Nobody watches it in Portland. That's insane. <laughs> no, and they brought it back. I love it. It's crazy to think that dinosaurs have been extinct for over 25 years. <laughs> That's a new character I'm working on. A guy who likes science isn't very smart, but isn't technically wrong. <laughs> it's crazy to think the ocean is deeper than two swimming pools in some places. <laughs> Got an email from my doctor the other day. I was really excited because she diagnosed me with polar bear disorder. Reread the email, I have bipolar disorder. <laughs> and I went from being real excited to real sad super fast. <laughs> oh, that's silly. <laughs> yeah, well, Abby, we'll close on something silly too, but we're just gonna do it. No, I'll throw money in here and everybody will applaud. It'll be insane. <laughs> I was driving here today and I saw a guy driving a PT Cruiser. Uh, that's not the joke. But uh, he had a bumper sticker on the back of his car that said, Four doors fit more whores. <laughs> yeah, he was alone. <laughs> I bet that dude's always alone. It doesn't help that he had a baby on board sticker next to him. It was like, his bumper sticker is like the answer to a question no one is asking. Like, why is that guy not driving a two-door? Oh, it's for the whores. Are they baby whores? Alright, that went weird. My name is Scott Rossi. Thank you so much. Thursday, to everybody knows, it's Serial Day. Woo! Yeah. Episode 10, no? None of you watch it. No? <laughs> the next seven minutes Some people really are not, not into it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Serial, of course, is the insanely popular podcast about how Adnan murdered somebody. Uh, what? <laughs> you mean how Jay murdered somebody? Spoiler <laughs> alert. Right, we'll start there. Why are you Team Jay? I just don't like he has all the facts. He knows you know, too much. Yeah, that seems reasonable. Do you think, you think it's Jay? No, I don't sound so handsome. <laughs> don't you think? He does, he does sound pretty handsome. What do, you do? what do you think? I think it was Sarah Koenig because I haven't addressed Mr. S. S. Sarah Koenig. Oh, dang. Follow the money, Alex. <laughs> Follow the money. She is the one made. <laughs> That's a 20 and a 10, so it's a big deal. $30. I, uh, I, I think that obviously the, people, the person who looks the worst of this whole thing is Best Buy, right? <laughs> yeah. They have the worst product placement in the history of radio. Ever. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about this then, since you want to move on. News this week, the man who was caught masturbating in the Old Navy, uh, I believe this was the, uh, the Lloyd Center Old Navy, got two years in prison this week. How do we feel about that? Is that enough time? No. I just no. went to that Old Navy. <laughs> <laughs> well, now. I want to go back, too. What'd you do there? <laughs> you want to go back there like three to five times per week? What do you? Oh, no, but, but all I have to say to that guy is that if he's so turned on by a good deal, he should have just stayed at home and waited until Cyber Monday like the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> just sending in, just logging into bed, logging into the Old Navy website, ASL. Tell me. They got some nice sweater ladies. <laughs> Sorry, man. You know, he, only, he only got caught in because he was at an old navy. You know, the guy at the gap never never gets caught. What did you do? 
<laughs> Wait a second. Is somebody Here? literally playing crickets at us? What's going on? Who's crickets, you guys? They, they should keep this place clean. It's a museum. <laughs> Night at the Museum Cricket. Yeah, there's a cricket sculpture of Sarah's that came alive. What? It's from the tree. What? Is there a decorative tree? This is, this is the judgiest ringtone. Thank you, somebody. <laughs> Somebody's ringtone, huh? Um, that's hilarious. Jeez. I mean, my feelings were hurt, but. Whenever, whenever my phone rings, it throws a tomato. It's really dumb. <laughs> Do you guys think that if he masturbated in a, well, the Banana Republic, he would have got four years? Oh, definitely. You have to bring your own banana. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Do they have bananas there, or just safari hats? Just republics. Oh, uh, Republicans? Just casual basics. <laughs> just safari hats. Uh, it's just for that dude who hangs out with Curious George. He's too shy. <laughs> A judge in Cornelius this week ruled that a Cornelius resident has to get rid of her rooster because they're technically legal because it's become a nuisance to the neighbors. Is this a problem you have in Seattle? Nuisance roosters? No. Or nuisters, as we call them here? <laughs> no, my neighborhood's overrun by tiny, tiny dogs. Oh. It's, it's, it's a different problem. Those are always a nuisance, also. They throw parties, they don't. They leave their garbage can out too long, they leave cigarette butts everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> what do you guys feel about the rooster thing? You think this is. Bree, uh, what do you think about this? Well, I read this story, and the saddest part of the story is the lady was didn't mean to offend her neighbors, but the rooster had gotten her through a very difficult time in her life, which the newspaper article did not elaborate on. <laughs> so let's all just take a moment and, and, and thank the gods that we have never needed a rooster to survive anything in our lives. Or, on the other hand, she should be thankful that she's never had a problem that having a, a rooster couldn't solve. <laughs> That's a pretty good life if all your problems are like, man, if only a rooster was here, this would be easier. I have way too much corn! <laughs> <laughs> I can't wake up in the mornings. <laughs> Who's gonna have sex with my chickens? <laughs> what else? Those are the three problems of rooster. What can a rooster do for you? Ladies and gentlemen, pay the lights, it's Scott Lousy! Who's your daughter? I'm Henry Pruitt! Uh, obviously, the Art is very kind to let us do a show in this space, uh, but that's not the extent of how kind the Art Museum has been to us. It's actually, well, it's almost it's almost embarrassing how uh, welcoming we have been to our comedy show, and I, I think, I, think I'll just, I should just show you, right? Uh, it was too good to pass up this opportunity. Uh, they basically let us do whatever we wanted here. And so what I did was I sent my writing staff, I assigned them to come here and pretend to be docents for an afternoon. And then we looked up what docent what was. Yeah, they found out it's basically a tour guide, and uh, uh, it just doesn't get paid, I think that's one of the main differences. Anyway, so my writing staff got to pretend to be art museum docents for an afternoon, and I'd like to show you a little bit of how that looks. So you see one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, counting the parrot. So this was even not this was the even period. They called it the even period because only even numbers. Okay. Okay, everybody, you'll notice that this is the next room full of paintings. And this is the Ronald McDonald Hall of Presidents. <laughs> that one isn't actually real. Do you guys enjoy this piece? Oh, I'm glad. Do you have any questions about the road? I'm very knowledgeable. I'd love to help you out. And uh, if you guys want to see some of the real shit, I've run a gallery downtown in Chinatown called the Paint Shack. Come on down. We have a lot of exciting stuff going on. Real groundbreaking work. Uh, right now we're running an exhibit called the Exhibit Exhibit. It's an exhibit entirely based around Oda Aficionado and Pit My Ride Legend. Exhibit. <laughs> some of the dirtier stuff you know this is you know here like let's just take a moment and take this in um, it's fruit and it's flowers and there's a monkey and he's 
he's interested in the fruit. He's excited by the fruit. And this is artists, you know, of this period getting out from under the Catholic Church and saying, you know, we're Protestants now. Maybe we get to eat fruit. And that's part of our sexuality now. Hey guys, I know these toilets can get a little bit boring. So if you want, I have some lollipops if you guys want to enjoy those. They got weed in them. Let me know. I'll be over here. Not only does this photograph feature a tiny little leg, but this guy is the one who invented books. His name was God. He's dead now. He died in a motorcycle accident. So she is reaching for a fig, um, but she's going to be bitten by the fig snake. And when she's bitten by the fig snake, she gets dragged to the underworld by Poseidon. And everyone, her servants, say, no, 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 don't eat a fig, eat a prune. They basically taste like the same thing, but they're, they're you know, seasoned, so there are no danger of snakes. People were so afraid of snakes at this period. Hey, guys, uh, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but you guys seem really cool. I just want to know this one. This is a Hitler painting. Yeah, I keep down the DL, though. Well, if you guys need anything else, I'll be around. He's been, oh, I've been picking figs all day. And this, you know, this heart on his lats, and you can see that he's an arm guy. He doesn't work on his lats. But because he loves her. He doesn't know there's a snake in that basket. He has no idea. Imagine you, sir, reaching into your Jack in the Box bag, right? Reaching for that Egg McMuffin, or the last couple of fries, right? They get, and, ah, snake bite, snake bite. Can you imagine? That was everyday life back then. Psst, 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 psst. I thought we were cool. Not many people knew this. In history, tickle fights would last for hundreds of years and were bloody territorial affairs. And there's a treasure map on the back of it. It's a Banksy. <laughs> hey! What the hell are you doing here? That was, uh, so that was uh, pretty pro, obviously. That was Anthony Lopez, Christian Ricketts, and Lucia Fasano. All did an amazing job. Big Bear helped us film it. Yeah, right, he's over there. Um, also, some of the people may have been our friends. All right, let's move on. Um, <laughs> you guys, our next guest is the head writer of Livewire Radio. Please welcome out Courtney Hollister! You're all gonna mock. Uh, you can feel free to mock me when I'm done. Uh, there are things in my life that I never knew how much I needed until I got them. Power steering, my first really good knife, a tiny computer that fits in my hand that uses games, tasks, and constant communication with friends to distract me from the ever-present knowledge that we're all gonna die alone. <laughs> and touch. Touch is a big one. I learned just how big when I met Joe. He is a guy I dated casually, who wasn't casual about cuddling. He was a master of the afterglow. Uh, the afterglow was that time that women referred to as the best part, and men referred to as <laughs> Girl. <laughs> Something like that. Um, in fact, his cuddle technique was such a convincing simulacrum of actual intimacy that it was jarring, but in a good way. And I haven't been able to figure out why until I had an appointment with Samantha Hess, the professional cuddler who recently opened up the cuddling studio, Cuddle Up to Me, uh, on Birdside. I went to her for a column I write called The Reluctant Adventurer, and uh, I do things with this column that terrify me, and then I review them. And this one qualified uh, possibly too much, but then I, I thought about it and I thought, you know, we've all had <laughs> one night stands, right? Of course. And, um, <laughs> and this is significantly less intimate than that, so I can totally do this. I just need two margaritas and a body shot and a, a massive rationalization. I can totally do it. Um, and then when I met Samantha, I went to Cuddle Up to Me and I met her and I understood the draw. She's, 
She's a five foot three, sort of impish brunette, and she has this very sweet, kind energy about her, and it just totally chipped away at my dread and just created a rapport that made me want to tell her everything. But I kind of, I tell the Safeway checkout guy everything, so that's not really a big deal. Um, so I went and I was given a questionnaire, a map of my body so that I could indicate where it wasn't okay to touch me, and a waiver uh, that laid down the ground rules among them. The, sex the session was not sexual in any way, no kissing, uh, and touching is limited to areas that would not normally be covered by a bathing suit. And so I was super glad that I wore my old-timey bathing suit so she didn't want to touch my ankles. Um, and then there's a pre-interview that she has, just to kind of get a feel. And a lot of times she'll do the pre-interview and then uh, it's not, and then it turns out she's like, I don't think this is right for you. Um, and so she said, what, what brought you here? And I, and I told her about Joe and my curiosity about, her early, about how early in a relationship that affection can appear and feel real enough to satisfy the need for it. Is it two dates? Is it one date? Is it after you sign a waiver and have a pre-interview? And um, so we finished the interview and I got into the cuddling bed. And, um, and my awkwardness level at this point was a solid 11, um, but it's really hard to tell how high that level, that level would have been if one of my editors hadn't been in the room with a camera. It was, in all the experience I've had doing this column, being photographed cuddling was by far the most uncomfortable, and I have been to a sex club. Um, it's very vulnerable. Receiving, like, receiving affection feels vulnerable because we're often seen as weak for needing it. And offering affection feels even more vulnerable because you might be rejected. So imagine yourself in either one of those positions being photographed for the internet, which is the home of the comment section. <laughs> um, so she started off with the motorcycle. So she was sitting behind me with her arms and legs wrapped around me. And it might have been nice, I don't know, but with a the camera there, it was akin, sort of comfort-wise, to having uh, someone suck my eyes out with a vacuum cleaner's upholstery attachment. Um, and so then she was like, let's try another position, maybe it'll be better, and it's called the Eiffel Tower. All of her positions are named. And you lie face to face, and our legs were intertwined, and we each had one arm over our heads with our hands clasped together. And now we sort of we all look at our phones much more than we look at each other. So so looking someone in the eye is almost aggressive. Um, also, no one likes to bed staring at each other unless they're in a Nicholas Sparks movie or a mouthwash commercial. So um, so that I went with the camera, put my comfort level right around, hand caught in a meat grinder while Christopher Walken raised from Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, so but then once the evil camera left. Samantha moved into a standard spoon with her as the big spoon, and she lay against my back and she ran her fingers through my hair. And it wasn't exactly the same as having a boyfriend do it, but I have to say, it was not that different. It was really nice. And, and the thing is, I have female friends who sometimes get massages because they just need to be touched, and they know if they don't, if they don't get a massage, they might do something dumb, like sleep with a douchebag. And I feel like this is actually a better way to get that taken care of. Um, I also once, I read a study claiming that there's, there's no discernible difference between the happiness that we feel because we got exactly what we wanted and the happiness we feel when we didn't get what we want, but we've convinced ourselves that what we did get was okay. And this felt like that to me. Um, and part of the reason I think the affection felt so real is who Samantha is. In the same way that some people are more generous financially than others, I think there are people like Samantha who are willing to offer true affection, like not guarded or empty or fake, before someone has proven to her that they deserve it. And I think that this might also explain Joe the afterglow guy. And, um, and yeah, she's taking money for it, but if you found something that you love to do, you were clearly born to do it, and by doing it you made the world a less sucky place, wouldn't you try to make it your career? Um, and she is, she's released a tidal wave of internet snark with her new business. Um, and even so, I'm not about to judge people who need to go to her. People who have access to physical warmth and affection all the time have no idea the emotional toll it takes on people who don't have it. Um, but future clients should know that paying someone to touch you in this way, when that kind of touch is missing in your life, has a marked poignancy to it. Because at the same time, it's exactly what you need and a reminder that you don't actually have it. So I recommend it mostly to every person in the comments section of YouTube. I think they just all need to be cuddled. Um, was it weird? Yes. Was it effective? Yes. 
So we're stuck in internet, and I mean that totally in a non-sexual touch kind of way. Ladies and gentlemen, how much Our next guest has never had a negative comment on YouTube in her life. Probably? What? All right, I'm guessing. Uh, she, her, uh, her work can be seen currently in the Apex Gallery here in the museum. Which is very cool. Please welcome. The, uh, this is very funny. I'm used to introducing comics. Uh, please welcome. Out. Uh, we're very lucky to have her. Whitney Red Star. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm almost saying you're very funny. That's weird. I think you are. I just, uh, I've just introduced a lot of comics that way. Um, Wendy, thank you for being here. Yeah, I brought you a gift. You brought me a gift? Yeah, and that, now I feel bad because actually, I really like you and I should have brought it for you. That's so but, sweet of you. Uh, I, can, I can take it from him. I'm we'll, right we'll, here. We'll see. <laughs> well, maybe you guys can uh, fight about it. Okay. Can we pass it back? Oh we'll show us what it is. This is amazing. Um, so I put on this kick where I've been beating these hats, and it's a hat that I found. Beating? Beating. Beating. Like okay. Native Americans, we yes. beat a lot. Right. Um, it's not like it's a beating hats. Like, it's not that hard. They're hats. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, so it's a Native Muscle Men hat, and they've been like flying off my website like hotcakes, so yeah. I wanted to give you one. That is so sweet. Thank you so it's much. It's a Native Muscle Man. Native Muscle Man, yes. yes. You know what? I've been doing this show for a couple years. This is my first on stage gift. First guest gift, yeah. Aww. Thanks. Aww. I'm gonna put him on the owl for now. <laughs> that, that's, thank you so much, Wendy. It is so cool to have you here. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, you, you mentioned you were funny. Let's, let's start here, actually. So you tackle a lot of very serious issues, but also are totally funny. Uh, and you have, how, is, how do you approach what you're doing where both of those can be totally possible? Um, well, like you said, I, I tackle some really difficult um, issues, and my way to get people into it, because they're very important, is to use humor. And I think um, by doing that, kind of breaking down some of the boundaries of those difficult issues, um, people uh, won't dismiss it, or they won't get um, defensive, and they'll take some time to kind of figure out what's going on or rethink it. Was that a conscious choice, or was that something that you were just like, you're also funny, so you wanted to say that, and then it worked? I'm super sarcastic, so I think I think it's just who I am. Yeah. I, there was an example, one of your, uh, so in your work currently uh, in the Apex Gallery, one of the things you've done for part of it is you've taken these old photographs that um, have been reinterpreted in different ways over the years, uh, and you're trying to rehumanize the, the figures in these works, right? Yes. Um, I just, one of the things, like, one of them, for example, you've written on the side, uh, my remains were sold for $500, and another one you wrote, I can kick your ass with my eyes. <laughs> yes, totally. And I think that, and those two are, like, right next to each other. I think that really captures the two things you're trying to do at the same time. Yeah. But tell us more about this gallery. If you haven't been upstairs yet on the fourth floor, which you should, because it closes this weekend, Tell us, tell us about what you did up there. Well, it's, um, first of all, it's like my favorite exhibition that I've done thus far. It's really important to me, and it's about my tribe, and I'm Crow, and Crow Indians were uh, from Montana area, originally from Montana, and those were our chiefs. So it was our first, um, when we got put on the reservation, these were the first reservation chiefs that are represented in that gallery. Um, and so it's called the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation. So basically, the government was trying to take a bunch of our land away, and uh, the chiefs traveled horseback for two weeks from Montana to Salt Lake, then they rode a train, which um, the chiefs kept thinking they would see an iron horse, because that's what it was called, and so they're like, where's the iron horse? And then they realized it was a train. <laughs> I'm just thinking that would be so so weird to have. Yeah. Disappointing. But also, that was like the first time ever on a train. How how wild was that? So they yeah. they uh, they went to Mount Vernon, and then they finally got to Washington D.C., and then they're basically held captive for 30 days to make them homesick, so that they would sign. Basically, the government wanted to take put the railroad through a big chunk of our territory. Um, so they also did weird things, like they took them to the zoo. 
Right. And um, so the whole exhibit is based on these two photographs of Chief Medicine Crow. And he's like super handsome. So I would just go up there just to see this incredibly handsome man. <laughs> um, so he's very captivating, but his image has been reproduced like on Honest Tea. You could find him on Honest Tea. He's been on like books like Native American law books. Like as a stock photo. Yeah, and it's just know. kind of, so it's weird because he's a crow chief of mine, and then to see him be kind of reproduced by artists and big kind of companies, but people don't, he's just like a handsome dude. And so I wanted to <laughs> say, well, actually, he's way more than that. He's Medicine Crow, and they wore their finest outfits, and he's got these two things that look like bows on his hair. And through doing research, I, I found out what each of the components of their outfits mean. So basically, what the, they're called hair bows, and what it means is that he had to overcome an enemy and slit their throat. So basically, he's walking around like a gangster. Like with a like, teardrop hey, tattoo. Yeah. He's like, I slit two people's throats, you know? <laughs> um, so all of that is detailed in each of the photographs. So they took a delegation photo, a group photo, which is up there of the chiefs, and then individual portraits. And I basically line out what I know about those chiefs. And one of them, Pretty Eagle, when he died, he was buried on our reservation. And then the Bighorn County Sanitarian stole his body and, and sold it to a museum. So I was just thinking it's so weird yeah, to see yeah. him and then to realize that when you die, your body's gonna be sold to a museum in New York and it will be there for 72 years. And then the Crow tribe, we're gonna get you back in like 94 and we're gonna have a big celebration. But how crazy is that? I mean, yeah, and, and when we see that photo normally, it doesn't have any of that no. part of that story. And so you've taken like the black and white photo and then in very striking red outlines, you've written notes about what things mean and also yeah. uh, occasional jokes, like my eyes could kick your ass. Well, totally, did you see his eyes? Yeah, he had really intense eyes. <laughs> you were right, they were, they were right on, well researched every yeah. bit. So and the other thing you have in that gallery, uh, similar, is that your daughter actually has work. Yeah, so I have a seven-year-old daughter and her name's Beatrice. And um, yeah, it kind of came full circle. So I was working really hard on um, uh, outlining the chiefs and writing down stuff. And she was curious, and I had printed out a bunch of Xerox copies. And I was like, here you go, leave me alone. Um, and you just gave her the pictures to draw on? I gave them to her, and then like she came back. I wasn't even thinking about it, because I was so like engrossed in what I was doing. And she just made this amazing, colorful, Thing. And I was, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to make 20 of them, different images of those chiefs, and then she just went to town, and it's full circle. It's really great. Yeah, it's so interesting because you've got what you were doing on them to tr add meaning for us, and then she was adding her own meaning to yes. it with green skin. Green, green skin, crowns, you name it. It's really great. It's also impressive because she's seven, and she's already displayed in the Portland Art Museum, which is a big... <laughs> I know. <laughs> that is a career achievement. It is really cool. She took her, um, just a couple weeks ago, her, her second grade class, she did a, a tour. She wore a traditional Altu dress, and um, I couldn't talk. She was sick of me talking. So <laughs> she, she ran the whole entire show. Yeah, it was great. And she even talked about the hair bows. Yeah. Slitting the throat. Like, she, yeah. She, well, so, Coolest second grader ever. Yeah, super <laughs> <fun>. <laughs> That's a pretty good show and tell. Uh, She's going to tell her bullies that she can kick their ass with her eyes. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. she'll get a hair bone. Uh, so her career is obviously taking off, but yours is also, uh, the response to your career has also been really incredible recently, this, uh, this exhibit included. Um, were you, are you surprised at the response to this? Uh, how has this been for you? It's been really crazy. So I was, uh, I lived here for about, six and a half years, and I actually know Holly. We both taught at PSU and PNCA, and I follow her on Instagram. It's really Isn't it great. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I was here, and then I moved away to back to Montana, back to my reservation, and I ran Chief Planifu State Park for a year. So one of the, one of the chiefs that's represented in the delegation, I ran his estate, which was really cool. I was a 
park ranger. I knew that because you wrote that on his picture. Yes, yes. Wow, you really looked at it. I did. Thank you. Um, so, and then I came back, and uh, it's just been really incredible. I've had four museum solo shows. Um, I'm featured on uh, four different magazine covers. Yeah, so many magazine covers. Yeah, so um, it's been a really incredible experience, but I, I also, I don't do art full time. I work at Native Arts and Cultures Foundation as a program associate, and and I'm really into promoting and strengthening Native arts, so that's right. another so thing I do. So this is what, I guess, I mean, this is a weird question, but like this reminds me of this, is I, are people taking this, like when they see everything you do, are they taking it, do you think the right way? Like are people... Appropriating that yeah, like, are we, are Indian like, hat? Are we reappropriating the what you're trying to rehumanize for us? Is that happening? I I say we. I don't mean to be doing it. Oh, you're uh, taking. <laughs> you know, but like, yeah. Is that? Do you think that's happening? I think um, I play with that a lot in my work. So um, um, I think that that's why taking taking a portrait of like Medicine Crow, who is very beautiful and sto stoically native, and then adding in information to it that you wouldn't expect. Right. I'm using what kind of a base level of like American like public school history knowledge is of Native people and using that and then uh, kind of jumping off of that. So, so I do kind of use these sort of stereotypical images, um, but to make you kind of get into it further, if that makes sense. But I also, I'm a ham. And that's why I like, you know, when I saw the Native Muslim man thing, I like to play with What's that too. Because it's all what part of our history. Like, Native people have been stereotyped. So yeah. I'm going to talk about that too. Yeah. Can't what, ignore is, it. what is the history of the, the Native Muslim man? Because, like, I'm afraid that if I. Like, badass? I don't know. But. but <laughs> I, like if I wear this, it's not like I'm supporting the Washington football team. Like there are different. No, things. you should go to the Redskins wearing that hat and letting them know what's up. Yeah. I think most of them would be like, "Yeah, you're on our side." Like, you're not on your so? side at all. <laughs> <laughs> so far away from your side. Well, what's funny is the hats have sold. Um, they've sold mostly to people in Canada, and they've been mostly First Nations people. So. Has the, has the response from First Nations people been amazing as well for all of your work? Yeah, I'm really um, intrigued by what's going on with contemporary First Nations art. Actually, it's kind of one of my favorite things. And um, yeah, I, I, I hope to get more into the Canadian scene, but I have a lot of friends who are in Canada, and most of them are wearing my hats. <laughs> they are. I mean, it's, a really, it's a really cool hat. And the exhibit in the, in the Apex Gallery right now is really striking. It's, it's amazing. You also have a piece, really, uh, one, thing I, I, one thing I noticed about it real quick, uh, is that you also have a piece that was in the museum's collection yes. that you are displaying without comment. Um, and I, I wonder if, since you are a ham and you're sarcastic, like, are you also needling the museum who's being nice to you like we are tonight? Are you also poking, at, poking back at them a little bit? With the dress? Yeah, by bringing out something from their collections that was, and putting in this very different context that's been displayed in before. Oh, yeah, I'm totally critiquing the way that Native people have been represented in museums, for sure. I mean, uh, this uh, series that I've done that's been really popular called The Four Seasons, I took a trip to the Natural History Museum in L.A. Yeah. And, um, and I went there because I knew I'd see something from my tribe, which I did. Um, but the Native American galleries were right next to the dinosaur, dinosaur exhibits. So um, for me, I'm, I wanted, to, because right below are the Native galleries. And so it was nice to be in the contemporary Northwest art wing. Right. But I, I also wanted to play with that. Like, wait a minute, people are going to be going down there and coming up and probably thinking, why is there a Native exhibit up here? Those so uh, well, I wanted to play with that as well. I'm definitely yeah. critiquing that. The photos Thank you for the Portland Art Museum. Yeah. <laughs> <Why did laughs> you do that? The photos where you're, the Four Seasons photos where you're you are posing yourself in these Thank dioramas. Yeah. Uh, is also very striking. Thank you. Uh, it's really amazing. You guys should definitely go again and check it out. It's on the fourth floor in the Apex Gallery. It's here through the seventh. So if you haven't yet, come back this weekend and, and check it out. Uh, and also uh, WendyRedStar.com. Yeah. Do you also Instagram? 
I do. You need to follow me. I'll I follow will. You. Well, uh, she obviously uh, Holly's not going to follow me back because I am garbage. But you, oh. she curates <laughs> her feet. Just croissants and latte art. <laughs> just terrible. A lot of selfies. Uh, what's your What's your Instagram handle? It's just Wendy Redstar. Wendy Redstar and WendyRedstar.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Wendy Redstar. <laughs> Let's bring up our musical guest, you guys. Uh, he's amazing. This is making his second appearance on Late Night Action. Please welcome out Mr. Brian Free! Top Hat now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're uh, a circus band. We all our top hats. 
No. You're a circus fan? Yeah. You know, we're kind of like Broadway, uh, pretty flamboyant. It, you know, it's kind of fast like that, but a lot more like dramatic. You do, I think I said this last time. There are no top hats. You sorry. sound, uh, well, right, not now. <laughs> when you're famous, there will be top hats thrown at you from the crowd every time. Uh, yeah. You can't call a band top hat and not expect the crowd to be mostly wearing top hats. I know, that's why we only played a few shows, because once we hit that ceiling, it's kind of over. <laughs> you're, trying, you're trying to stay below the top hat, the kind of like throwing? Muscle hat or something. Are you? <laughs> Are you, uh, uh, are you just playing anything upcoming? Can we, where are we going to find out more about Top Hat? Uh, you know, Facebook and... and are, do you have Facebook.com slash Top Hat? Because I would be real impressed. <laughs> it's like Top Hat uh, Enterprise or PDX. It's one of those. But, you know, Google. Just try some stuff. You'll find it. Right. <laughs> uh, just put into Google Top Hat and then click the shopping link. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll probably get there. Yeah. Will you play another song without Top Hat just as yourself? Uh, right now, Top Hat isn't here right I now. I know, that's what I'm saying. We play as yourself, because there's no Top Hat. Oh, wait a minute. What's the clip? That was a confusing thing. Uh, I'd just like to hear one more song. Oh, yeah. This is a Top Hat song. That one was a, was a me song. Okay, tell, so tell us about the song. Oh, well, this song, this is called The Tavern Athlete. It's been, I spend a, a fair amount of time at, um, you know, my local little bar. There's this uh, dude that always comes in, and he's great at the, um, the golf Super T, whatever it is. Yeah, oh yeah. He's one yeah of golden, golden, golden yeah. town. But I was thinking it would be rad if there was a guy who was just like the tavern athlete. Like, he just had this little bag and it had like his bowling ball and um, you know, like a cue stick and a glove. Darts. Yeah. Everything. And he, would, he was the tavern athlete, so. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brian Free! <laughs> All hail this Monday and the coming of the Tavern Athlete. Her goose tail flight spinning like a Shawnee arrow. All hail the backswing it will in its power to the follow through. God rest the buckshot down in a quarter's transaction And everyone is honored just to watch the game We get low, the lights and cheer The little guy, that little fucker He's tied up, tied up